We're in the second part, which I told you it may, might take three weeks to wrap this message up. The Lord will wrap it up today, I know, because he has already uh, put together exactly what he wants for this service today. Last week, as you uh, remember, we started a just a two-week, might have been three, series on the unity in the body of Christ. How many of you remember last week's message? Three of you, that's wonderful. Okay, we'll go ahead and go through last week's message as we get into today. Last week's message, as we began, we talked about unity in the body of Christ. We talked about how that we live in a time today where unity is one of those words that's not used. We see that occurring in our families. We see that occurring in our country. In fact, in fact the word unity has been replaced with the word divide, division. And division causes dissension. How many of you realize we're facing that in our country today? Would you not agree with me? doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. If you live on the soil of the United States, we are all Americans. Amen. We should not be a divided country. In fact, history will tell you that when you're divided, you fall. You look at all of the countries that, be, that, had cre that d division came within, dissension happened, and that country failed, and it fell terribly. I mean, look at the Roman government. I can go on and on and on. We look where there's divisions within the household, within the family. Guess what happens? There's divorce. Unity. Unity. What does it mean? It means to bring us together. All the parts coming to get together for in, in one accord, in one mind, as the Word of God says, being unified. And I fear that there has become a great divide within the body of Christ. Uh, we talked last week about uh, the division of, of uh, denominations, and then there's division within the denominations. How many of you believe that there's one God? Amen, church? Amen. There's one Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is no other. At the very name, as we sang this morning, at the very name, the demons flee. At the very name of Jesus, salvation comes. At the very name of Jesus, we realize that he is the only way of our salvation. And one day, every knee will bow before him. You can either do it now or you can wait till the judgment. Amen, church? Amen. So we're going to talk about unity. And last week, Part of that discussion about unity, I shared with you that there are three parts. And the first part was that I fear that we're missing out on, and, and that's the power of prayer. The Word of God says, and Jesus said this, that my house shall be a house of prayer. And many churches today have left prayer at the door and don't welcome that communication and conversation with Jesus Christ. How many of you talk to the Lord every day and everywhere, 24-7? I have conversations with Him all the time. He's my heavenly father, and I just love talking to my God, and I can do that through Jesus Christ. Amen? I believe this is one of those areas in the unity of the body of Christ that we're missing, and, and we're paying dearly for it because we are not coming to the Lord and communicating with him and seeking his wisdom and his guidance within his church. So the power of prayer. You know, the word of God says in Hebrews chapter 13, Verse 8, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He hasn't changed. But for some reason, along the way, the body of Christ has changed. Unity within the body of Christ. How many of you pray for that each and every day? This coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, Gary will have a praise fest over at, uh, at uh, Meeks Park from 1 to 6 o'clock where we've asked all churches to get together. This is not a Fellowship of the Hills deal. This is where all the churches will come together. And I would love to tell you that every church within Union County will be there next week, but that's not the case. I'd love to tell you that every Tuesday morning when I meet with pastors, an email blast that goes out. Brother David sends that out every week with a reminder on Monday evening. goes out to all the pastors within this area. And there's usually the same four or five that show up every Tuesday morning at 8 o'clock at Chick-fil-A. Wouldn't it be great that one day we would walk over there and we say this prayer every, every uh, Tuesday as we leave. Wouldn't it be great one Tuesday if we showed up in Cabin Call, excuse me, and uh, Chick-fil-A was packed with the pastors in Union County with one accord seeking God's guidance and wisdom for those flocks that he has commanded us to oversee. Wouldn't that be a great thing? Wouldn't it be a great thing to see that happen throughout the state of Georgia, throughout the United States, throughout the world, where those that claim to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior would unite under the banner of the cross, and we would see unity take place within the church. Would that be a great thing? So it begins with prayer. It begins with prayer. Well, as I thought about that, and the Lord was taking us to this message, just for a quick recap, remember what the Apostle Paul shared with us in Ephesians chapter 1 excuse me, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And again, I'm going to ask you to follow along. I've got several scripture for you this morning that the Holy Spirit is taking to. As a recap from last week, Paul said this to the church of Ephesus, he says, Therefore, 
I am a prisoner of the Lord a bondservant of the Lord, one that is willing to serve the Lord, sold out to him to go and to do whatever Jesus Christ would call and command us to do. And he talks to us, he says, I implore you to walk in the manner worthy of your calling, which you have been called with all humility and gentleness and patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Therefore, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father, all of all, who is over all and through all and in all. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we serve one God. Amen, church? And we're to be united in the bond body of the Christ. In the bond of Jesus Christ. So that first part we talked about last week was prayer. In fact, I gave you a key verse that I said, keep with you for the rest of the week. It's the, out of the, the first church there in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. It says, these all with what? One mind. With one mind. They were continually the, the, devoting themselves to prayer. Continually devoting themselves to prayer. I've shared with you on Wednesday night that we have a time of prayer. It's called No Agenda Prayer. We come here without any formal outline of what the Holy Spirit's going to do. We allow the Holy Spirit to direct us. We gather in that back corner back there as some of the other Bible studies are taking place just for a time in the power of prayer, seeking God's guidance and wisdom for His people and for His church. To be in one mind, in one accord. And let me tell you what will happen. In fact, if you look, and I want you to search there with me. Come on, go, to, go in your word to, this morning to Romans chapter 16. Notice what Paul says here in Romans chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 16, it says this. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and, and hindrances care, uh, uh, contrary to the teaching which you learn, and turn away from them. He starts off by telling us that as the bond of Christ and, the, and uh, under the bond of Christ is the body of Christ, we're to greet each other with a holy kiss. Wouldn't it have been great this morning if you'd have walked in this place and someone put their arm around you and gave you a holy kiss in the Lord? Amen? Really? Some of you go, oh, i got to think that one through, right? How many of you would like to just get a hug from someone? How many of you need a hug this morning? Hey Amen. Who needs a hug? If that person raised their hand, they need a hug. Will you just reach over and give them a hug this morning? Doesn't that feel good to feel that warmth of someone who really cares about you? Or a nice firm handshake and say, brother, a sister, it's just nice to have you with us today. My prayer is that you'll never walk in Fellowship of the Hills and you feel as if you're all alone. How many of you have walked into one of those quote-unquote churches and you felt all alone? You felt unwanted, that, that you felt like nobody wanted you there? Yeah. In fact, how many of you have walked into one of those places, sat down, they said, you're in my seat? <laughs> yes. Paul goes on and he shares there and he says, listen, if we see those people that are causing dissension or hindrances that are contrary to the teaching, we need to pay attention to that. We need to make sure that that doesn't occur, that doesn't exist and shouldn't be in the house. And one of the protégés of Paul, Titus, who was led to the Lord by Paul, who happened to be one of his emissaries there delivering the letters to the church of Corinth. Notice what he says in chapter 3 of the book of Titus in verse number 9. In verse number 9 through 11, Titus says this, But avoid foolish controversies and, and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Let me tell you something. Dissension, divisions are profitless within the house of God. How many of you like to be divided? Anybody just, just look for a good fight? Nobody does, right? Nobody looks forward to that. And let me tell you, within the, within the body of Christ, there are to be no divisions. So last week we talked about the power of prayer and how that we must be a church. Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. And the next part of that equation, I believe that the Holy Spirit is teaching us in this lesson, as the Lord brought it to me several weeks ago, as Susan and I were in Wichita having a wonderful time with our grandchildren and, and enjoying that bond with our family. And the sweetness that we have, even when we're separated, we still have that bond. I was talking to our oldest daughter on uh, Friday, and uh, it was kind of interesting that the Lord uh, spoke to me to call her 
Uh, I was going to get gas at Walmart, and as I was pulling the gas station, it was about 8, 8, 10, and they're about an hour behind us, and I knew she would be delivering one of the kids, of the three kids that go to school. One of them was going to be, she was, had one of them in route, and I just called her and said, honey, Chrissy, I just want you to know, honey, your dad loves you today. And she says, well, I've got Quinlan with me. That's our youngest. And she says, you must have known today was grandparents' day at school. I said, no, I didn't know that. You know, we, we, we weren't there. Obviously, we were there a week ago. And she said, little Quinlan said, hi, Pappy. And I heard her in the background. And uh, she says, see, Quinlan, you can take Pappy with you today. You can go tell everybody that Pappy called you today on Grandparents' Day. Now, I felt about this big because I wanted to be there on Grandparents' Day. But wasn't it a blessing that even when we're at a distance, that bond of family, that unity with family exists. And I got to talk to my little Quinlan while I was pumping gas at Walmart. Amen. Well, within the bond and the body of Christ, we talk about prayer. And I believe the next, the next important part within that equation for the body of Christ is to have vision. To have the vision that God has for his church. How many of you believe we should have a vision on all that we do in life? Yes or no? Uh, anybody ever been the CEO of a company? Anybody? I know I've got one gentleman in here that's the CEO of a company. Let me tell you something. When they hire a CEO of a company, part of the resume of that CEO is to find out what his vision will be for that company. You would never bring a man or a woman in to be the CEO of your company if they said, I've got no vision. I just need a job. It pays good, right? You don't want to hire that dude. He's not the one that's going to take your company to its next level, right? You want to hire someone that's a visionary. You want to hire a CEO that's going to take your company to its next level to bring it more profit. Yes or no, church? Absolutely. How about the, well, being tender with this one, in politics. We want to put those people in office that have a vision for where our country needs to be. Amen? All right, now there's an advertisement there. You read the Holy Scriptures, right? And it'll tell you what the vision needs to be for this land. And if it's contrary to this word, they don't need to be in office. Amen, church? Amen. If they, well, I could go on and on. That would be another whole message, would it not? But the reality is, is when we step inside that voting booth and we select that person, we select the best person that has the best vision under the Word of God, right? The best vision for this country. Amen, church? Absolutely. Absolutely. We want someone with vision. Let me ask you a question. Should not the church have vision? Yes or no? Yes or no? How many of you believe that God gave vision for his church? So what is the vision? What is the vision that God has for his church? Would you not agree with me that the vision God has for his church is that we go out and we reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ? How many of you would say amen to that? Amen. Really? That's the best we can do this morning. I had like uh, 120, 130 in there in here this morning at the first service, probably about the same amount this morning in this second service here. All of you, most of you are sitting over here. I asked that same question. You know, usually nine o'clock service, like, <laughs> they were wound up this morning. They were good. Let me ask you the question again. How many of you believe that the vision that God has for his church is that we reach the lost for Jesus Christ? Yeah. Well, if that's true, how come we're not doing it? If that's true, how come we're not doing that? How come we don't have a passion and a compassion to go and reach the lost? If that's his vision, how come we don't have that passion and compassion to reach the lost for Jesus Christ? In fact, I want you to notice something here. If you will, turn with me. Mark it down. Follow along. This is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38. Notice what Jesus said. He says, seeing the people... Now, when you leave this morning, I want you to notice something. When you leave this house this morning, you're going to see a majority of people, not just today, but the remainder of the six days of the week. They'll come from all walks of life. You may have one that comes to your house because there's a need, and I'm going to share my testimony with you of what happened this past Wednesday. Jesus says, when you see the people, notice this. He says, seeing the people, Jesus, he felt compassion for them. How many of you have compassion for others? How many of you have compassion for the lost? We have them within our families, do we not? Yes or no, church? How many of you want to see every one of your family members die and go to hell? Come on, let me see your hand. Raise your hand real quick. You say, Marty, that's a pretty cruel thing to say. Well, let me ask you a question. When was the last time you shared Jesus with them? You may be the only voice they'll ever listen to. 
How many of you want to see that man at Walmart or that man and woman that uh, you, 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 uh, you have served you at one of the restaurants? How many of you say, well, pastor, I want to see them die and go to hell? You say, well, pastor, that's a mean thing to say. Well, let me ask you this question. When was the last time you had a passion and a compassion to share Jesus with them? And Jesus said, I see the people. And Jesus had compassion, said he felt compassion for them because they were what? Distressed and dispirited. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Let me tell you what, we have a lost world. I told you last week, one of the most difficult things for me to pray for is my enemies. Praying sometimes for some of these politicians is hard for me to swallow, I got to be honest with you. But the word of God commands me to do it. Commands me to pray that their heart will be changed. How can their outlook and, and their vision for this country change? It can change when Jesus Christ gets a hold of their life. Amen, church? And Jesus said to his disciples, notice this. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So, Pastor, this is another one of those messages. You're going to get up and bow breed us, browbeat us on outreach, right? Let me tell you what, if a pastor doesn't stand in the pulpit and encourages people to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, he needs to get out of the pulpit. Amen? Therefore, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, he says in verse number 38, I beseech you, he says, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest. Jesus says, listen, I'm I beseeching you, go out and, and take the workers into the harvest uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, we're going to have a, a tent set up there, a, a time of prayer. We're going to have a bounce house set up for the kids and, and encourage them. And, and we're going to need some help. And those who would like to volunteer and come between those hours of 1 and 6 and, and hang out and watch the kids jump around and play in the bounce house, or if they would like to come and kind of hang out at the tent and share Christ or just walk throughout the park there, I encourage you to come. That door's open to everyone, not just me. And Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. Let me ask you a question. Is the harvest as plentiful today as it was 2,000 years ago? What do you think? You say more? Well, if you're saying more, then what's happened to the church? Why aren't the churches across America and across the world filled today? Why isn't it? Because we've lost the vision. We lost the vision. And Jesus went on, notice in John chapter 4, verse 35, he says, Do you not say, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? In other words, should we wait? You know, is, is that what we're supposed to do? You know, got to wait for things to be watered and, and, and fed? I mean, and, and, and then we go out? What did Jesus say? When us, behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for the harvest. You need to be that one that's planting the seed, that one that's watering the seed. You need to be that one that's going out and reaping the harvest. The vision for the church is to seek and to save those that are lost through the blood of Jesus Christ at the name of Jesus. That's the vision for his church. You want to see some incredible blessings take place here in the life of Fellowship of the Hills? That we need to be that local church that believes in the outreach and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do we do that, Pastor? You know, the Lord can use anything. Amen, church? He can use anything. Just this past week, I shared with the first congregation. How many of you follow me on Facebook, my personal Facebook page? How many of you? Well, thank you for the three of you that do that. Amen, praise God. Yeah. Well, we have the church Facebook page. I didn't put it on that one. I put it on my personal one because I wanted folks that, I have a lot of folks that don't know Christ that are on my Facebook page, guys I've worked with, guys that are part of, that I meet throughout the course of my training from time to time in law enforcement. And I want them to know how God continues to use me in an incredible way in serving him. And not just from this pulpit. This past week, we had some work done. Wednesday, we had prayer time getting ready to take place. This past Wednesday, we had some work done in our house. It was some electrical work. Had nothing to do with plumbing whatsoever. And these men were under my house, got it taken care of. And for some reason, and I know God did this, they left a little hatch door open going underneath my house. I said, I need to go close that. Those guys left it open. And I said, you know what? Before I close it, I'm going to go under my house. Anybody ever explored under your house? I do that from time to time. You know, it's kind of cool down there. Yeah, you see all kinds of weird things under there. So I thought I'd go explore. Our house is not built on a basement. It's on a cross base. So I, I started exploring under the house. Now listen, the Lord had that door left open for a reason because when I went and explored underneath my house, I stepped in a puddle of water. And I said, that's not supposed to be there. 
So I began to fish around and dig around where that little puddle of water from that PVC pipe was going down in the ground. And as I dug away, they must have somehow, some way, a rock got stepped on and just a hairline crack in that PVC pipe, which I had to go and shut the water off to my house. We had no water in the house. Mama's not happy when there's no water in the house. Amen, church? So I now have to call a plumber. I called the guys. You know, they, these, these guys are electricians. They, they, this wasn't their deal, and they apologized for it, and you need to get it fixed, Marty. So I said, you're right. So I called a plumber. And I've got church coming up. Got no agenda prayer coming up that night. I ain't got time. This is about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And thank the Lord that the young man that I called that owns a plumbing company locally, he sent one of his men out ASAP. I had never met this man before. He's a young man. He's married. He has a child. I found this all out while we were sitting up underneath the crawl space of my house. This young man came out. I told him I'd already had it dug out. I already got the water turned off. He said, thank you. And I said, listen, I said, I just need this fixed. He says, we're going to take care of it right now. So I went underneath the house with him. He had his can of glue and his hacksaw and a couple of pieces of pipe. I could have probably fixed it myself. But the price, I probably should have fixed it myself. <laughs> but God had a reason and had a plan. I wasn't happy. In fact, let me ask you this question. How many of you had a, had a couple of things happen this week you're not happy about? Didn't go the way you wanted it to go? It just wasn't cool? You know, right? How many of you believe that God allows these things to happen in our life because he wants to teach us something? Maybe he wants to use us. Maybe he wants to put you someplace. You ever had your car break down? Anybody ever had your car break down? When was the last time you were at roadside, the record showed up, instead of getting angry, you looked at him and said, you know what, man? Things like this happen. That's just part of life. Can I share Jesus with you? He said, Marty, that's not the time. When is the time? Let me tell you what, I did not want to leak at my house. I didn't want that. I had things to do. I had a place I needed to be. I had to call Joel up. I said, Joel, listen, I don't know how long this is going to take. Can you handle no agenda prayer? And I love Joel. Joel says, I got it covered. And so here's what I did. This young man comes out, and he goes up underneath my house with his hacksaw, his can of glue, and his PVC pipe. And while I'm underneath the house, he begins to share with me. We've got nothing else to do. In fact, I thought it was kind of funny. As he put it all together, he's, he looks at the can. He says, we've got to let the glue dry. I'm, and, of course, I'm thinking to myself, what's it cost to let glue dry? <laughs> and he leans back while we're under the house, and he begins to share his story with me about how he moved from Texas and some things that had happened in his life. And he's got this little boy and his young wife, and how he wants things to be different. He doesn't want it to be how it was when he was a child. Lost his mother to cancer. He's been angry at God. His father was on the road all the time, never saw him. He says, I want to be different. Boy, that opened up a door. And I began to share with him about my life, some of my personal testimony, and how life can be different, and how Jesus changed my life. You see, at that moment, I wasn't a pastor. I didn't have my Bible. I didn't have a pulpit. It's just like I do when I go anywhere else. But this time, the Lord allowed a leak at my house. The glue dried. We walked out from underneath the basement. He wrote out the bill. I wrote him a check. And I thought it was over. And then he says to me, he says, can I talk to you some more about my life? I said, oh, yes. So we stood by his service truck. And he told me some more about his life, and I shared more about mine. And then I said, listen, before you go, I've just got to ask you this question. We've had this communication. I said, do you want your life to be different? Do you want there to be meaning in your life? Do you want this eternal life? Do you want salvation that Jesus has for you? He didn't bat an eye. He said, yes. And I'm thinking, Thank you, Lord, for the leak. And Susan was watering the grass and had the dogs outside. And I said, listen, my wife's out here. She's a pastor's wife. I said, can I bring her here as we pray? He said, yes. Susan, I yelled for her. She threw the hose down. She walked over. We put our arms around him. He put his arm around me. And I said, listen, I've already prayed this prayer. But I says, if you want Jesus and you believe in what we've talked about and what he can do, you can pray this prayer. And call him the name of Jesus. And Susan and I, with our arms around this young man, he prayed and accepted Christ as his Savior by his service truck. And he stayed for another hour, hour and a half. Gene was across the street with David, one of our other neighbors. And Gene walked over and I said, Gene, I said, guess what this young man just did? Did I not, Gene? 
And Gene and, and David got to share with him and love on him. He never left my house. I was so thankful I'd already paid the bill. <laughs> but let me tell you, let me tell you something. God can use anything for his glory. You see, unity in the body of Christ, you have to understand that part of that unity within the body of Christ is to understand that God has a vision for his church. And the vision for his church, which is the people of God, is to share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever you are. Wherever you are. It doesn't have to, we don't have to load up a bunch of motorcycles and go to Sturgis or go to Daytona. Let me tell you what, the fields are wide unto harvest outside the doors of Fellowship of the Hills. How do I know this? I, Carl came up to me. Carl, I want you to come here. And uh, Carl came up to me before the service. I'm going to hand that to you. Carl came up to me before the service. He said, I want to share with you something big happened to me this week. And he began to share a testimony of what happened to him this week in sharing Jesus. I said, Carl, you're never going to believe this. But I said, we're talking about unity within the body of Christ and God's vision for the church. I want you to share what happened to you. It's amazing when I get the blessing to share with you. But I get blessed when I get to hear other folks within the body share. Share what happened y'all doing today? God is good. All the time. And all the time. Amen. Um, I've been laid up for quite a while, but uh, I was able to uh, get out and about here recently, and I went to uh, Walmart on Friday to uh, do some grocery shopping for my lovely wife. And uh, I was at the register, and I was uh, paying for the groceries, not really paying attention to what was going on around me. And I guess a young lady was standing next to me, and she mentioned, she says, hey, I really love your bracelet. So I had the normal, God has got this bracelet on, and I says, oh, yeah. I says, well, since you love it so much, here, how about if I give it to you? She broke down in tears. Her eyes were just bawling her eyes out. I took it off and put it on her hand, and I said, whatever's troubling you right now, God's got it. And uh, so I just proceeded to uh, finish paying my bill, and I started walking out the front of Walmart, and... The Holy Spirit just told me, you're not done yet. And I'm like, keep right on walking. And he says, I'm telling you, you ain't done yet. Okay, so I turned the car around and walked back over to the front where she was trying to pay for her goods. And I waited for her to come out. And uh, when she walked up across the aisle in the front of Walmart, I asked her, I says, ma'am, can I talk to you for a second? She says, yeah. I says, uh, would it be okay if I prayed for you? And she said, please. So I said, what, what is it that's troubling you? And it turns out she was a Walmart employee. She worked there, and, and she was having troubles with her, her position. Or she, did, she was a little bit hesitant about going into it. But I said, that's okay. God can take care of it. So I put my arm around her, and I uh, started praying with her. And uh, she's still wiping the tears from her eyes. She's just crying like crazy. And, and uh, so I finished praying, and, and, you know, I thought again, God... This is all good and done. So I said, well, you have a blessed day. And I said, if uh, you, know, you don't have a church to go to, we're not out trying to pull you in, but you're welcome to come to ours. And she said, well, she says, I have a church. She says, I'm just having a, a tough time right now. So I said, okay. Grab my cart, start walking away. And she says, no, no, wait a minute. She says, can I give you a hug? And I said, I'm all for it right here, <laughs> you know. So uh, she wrapped her arms around me, gave me a big old hug. And then when she left, I put the band on her left, right hand, and she took it out. She said, I'm going to cherish this forever. And I said, praise God. It was a great day. I was so excited. I came to the church. I know Pastor wants me to hurry, but I came uh -huh. to the church. In fact, the Burtons are here somewhere. They were here, and I told them the story. But I was looking for Pastor. I had to tell Pastor, and they said, ah, he wasn't here. I was so excited. So I, God blessed her, and he blessed me just by taking that That's step right. to, uh, to reach out. So. Amen. So, yeah, give the Lord a hand for that. So, so, so can God use anything? How many of you believe, believe that everything that you do, everywhere you're at, God has ordained that as a special time for you to share the gospel with him? Listen, today you're going to leave this house. As the, the group this morning, they're probably having brunch or breakfast somewhere. And I prayed, and the challenge to them was that no matter where you go, you can have the blessing and the opportunity of sharing Jesus Christ uh, as I shared with the group, we were late getting out of here last week and I had the blessing of going and having uh, dinner uh, over at a restaurant this past week, uh, this past Sunday, uh, and, and, and being with them and, and the young lady that we had an opportunity to share a bracelet with. One of these simple bracelets. What does this bracelet do? This bracelet doesn't provide salvation. You know what it does? It opens the door of communication. 
And when you tell someone, I want you to know God's got this, God can have your life and he can change your life. He can do amazing things. And when you ask someone if you can pray with them, it's amazing how that door will open. You know, there's a lot of waiters and waitresses today that will be in restaurants and they'll be served by all kinds of church people. Do you know that being a waiter and a waitress on Sunday morning after the church crowd is the worst time to work? They will tell you that. You know why? Because Christians can be the nastiest people in the world. Why should it be that way? We should be a church that's united to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and let it flow through each and every one of us. Why is that? Because that is the vision of God's church. Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, notice this. What profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What profit is it if you have everything but not Jesus? That's the question that's being asked. And that's the question that we need to remember because it will create within us a passion and a compassion for the loss and realize that the work for us is many. The work for us is many because the harvest is plentiful. How many of us are willing to catch the vision for Jesus Christ? I look around this congregation as I saw the first one this morning, and I, I remember the vision that God gave Susan and I as we began to plant this church. And looking back, uh, it would be 11 years, uh, October 6, as we look back, I think of those few that were in our home when we had our house over at Notley Highlands. The only people I knew here was my brother and his wife and having the blessing to lead her to Christ and her daughter. And to see where God has brought us today. To see the blessings of reaching others for Jesus Christ and those being baptized. To, to see the blessing of those who have been in churches some of their life and never having a relationship with Jesus Christ, but having a relationship with religion to see what God has done. I wouldn't trade it for anything. As I look back on that, I, I do at times, the devil will say, you know, you could have had much more of this world. I remember when we first came here and the investment that was made financially for Susan and I as this church began. I remember needing some additional work to pay for the various things that needed to be taken care of and, and wondering how my retirement was going to take care of that. And the Lord provided work for me, traveling. It was always amazing. The Lord always had me on a plane late on a Sunday and always back by Tuesday or Wednesday, just a couple of days a week, and meeting the provisions that he had for us and in the plan of this church. And I look back and I think sometimes the, the devil will try to remind us and say, listen, you could have had so much more. You see, I love the beach. I love the water. I love the mountains, but I just love the water. And maybe someday, I don't know, maybe the Lord will put me on a cruise ship as a pastor. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> that might happen. But I'll tell you what, wherever I'm at, that's where God's ordained me to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like you. Just like Carl. You see, that's the vision that God has for his church. So, so what profit is there if I gain the whole world, if I can make all the money and buy all the things but yet lose my soul or miss that opportunity in sharing the gospel with someone else. By the way, let me share something with you. This young lady that needed prayer, God gave Carl the blessing to share with her. And if Carl refused to do that, let me tell you what, that woman is still going to get prayer. Amen, church? God's going to use somebody. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss the blessing. You see this young man who was led to Christ on Wednesday afternoon underneath my house. God will use a leak. He'll use something to have led that man to Christ had it not been me. Amen, church? I want the blessing. Well, not just the vision, but understanding that the unity of the church is in the power of prayer. It's in the vision of understanding what God has for His church and reaching the lost. And it's also understanding that in reaching the lost that we must be a people of faith. A people of faith. Well, what is that? Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, notice this. Paul said this, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it has the what church? The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Listen, we are a people of faith. Amen, church? Well, when did the church lose that? When did the church lose its zest and its appeal and its desire to be a people of faith? I don't know about you, but I carry the banner of the cross at my home. I proudly wave old glory. Amen, church? I'm proud of being an American, and I'm proud of waving its flag. Even in a country today that we have a group of people that are trying to divide us and say that shouldn't wave the flag. Why shouldn't I wave the flag? I'm proud to be an American. I should never be embarrassed of being a Christian. Because it is my faith that I stand on. It is in the name of Jesus that I stand on. It's the name of Jesus that brings me salvation. It is the name of Jesus that I call on. The people of faith. Sadly, we have many who claim to know Jesus Christ, say that they're part of the body of Christ, but they're ashamed to be called a Christian. Could you imagine the worst thing that ever be said about you is for someone to walk up and visit Fellowship of the Hills and see you, and they would go, I never knew that you went to church. I mean, the worst thing somebody could say about you, I, I never knew you knew Jesus. The next worst thing would be is for them to say, why didn't you ever share him with me? Why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? And Paul said that if we are truly united in the body of Christ, then there are attributes, those, there are things that we'll display and exhibit as the body of Christ. And go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. As I wrap up with this, and Gary will be prepared in just a moment to come lead us in Just As I Am. Beautiful song. United in prayer, united with the vision, and united in our faith, Paul says this, if we truly are followers of Jesus Christ, notice what he says in chapter 3 of Colossians, verses 12 through 17. He says, so, I love it when he starts off that way, so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, Put on a heart of compassion. Hey, let me see you folks that are compassionate. Where are you at? <laughs> Three or four of you raised your hand. That ain't me, brother. He was a follower of Jesus Christ in the body of Christ. I'm to be compassionate. Yes or no, church? He says that, that we're to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You see, I had to pause at that one. Patience. I'm working my way through that, and I'm thinking, okay, I, I pretty much got that covered. And I got to patience. I was reminded of that one this morning. Usually a lot on Sunday mornings. I get up real early. Susan does too, and we take care of all the things that need to be taken care of, or I should say she does, as I go and I sit and have my quiet time with the Lord in preparation. Whatever last things that the Lord and the Holy Spirit has for us this morning, Susan has fed the dogs. The bed is made. I'm already dressed, ready to go in my quiet time. And I hear this, mm, every Saturday night, washing the hair. Mm, I'm thinking, why she have to do it every Saturday night? Where's she at? Oh, she's in the nursery. So, so I say, honey, we got to go. And she'll look at me. Don't you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> and she'll say, don't you rush me. Isn't it a shame that we haven't learned to have patience? Something every day the Lord teaches me about patience. I don't know about you, but I need to be still and know that he's God. I need to be patient and wait upon him. Wednesday afternoon. I could have gotten angry. But I had to be patient and understand God had a plan. Had a plan. So he says that we're to be patient. Bearing one another's burdens and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so should you also forgive them. Well, that sounds kind of funny in the house of the Lord, doesn't it not? You mean, pastor, as Christians, we got to forgive each other too? Yeah. Why can't we just go start another church? 
It happens, doesn't it? It happens. You've heard me talk about this all the time. Listen, I don't mind you getting upset with me. I really don't. Because we can have differences, but we're still supposed to love each other. Amen? And if you feel the Lord has led you some place else, I, I, I want you to be where God wants you to serve. Don't follow me. Don't ever do that. You follow where God wants you to be and where you're going to serve, not sit and soak. Amen, church? Amen. But you don't get mad and grab a bunch of people and say, you know what, we're just going to go start our own thing. That's not being humble, and that's not being forgiving and working through forgiveness. Beyond all these, notice what he says, put on love, which is what, church? The perfect bond of unity. Put on love. Isn't it amazing? He said, beyond all these, put on love. You see, when you put on love, it captures all of that. You see, if you put on the bond of love, you could be patient with other people. You put on the bond of love, you could forgive others. When you put on the bond of love, when someone's going through a difficulty, you're there with them. You're praying with them and loving on them. Amen, church? When you put on the bond of love, it's not all about you. You know how to be humble. When you put on the bond of love, you have passion and compassion for other people. Amen, church? When you put on the bond of love, you even pray for your enemies. I love it when he says this, beyond all these things, put on love because that is the perfect bond of unity. Verse number 15, he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. What's it say, church? Let it what? Rule in your hearts. In other words, let it have dominion. Let it take over. Let the peace of Christ take over your heart. To which indeed you were called in what church? Called in what? One body. Called in one body. And be thankful. How many of you are thankful for the person sitting next to you this morning? Yeah. How many of you are thankful for that person that sits on the other side of the church? He said, well, Pastor, wait a minute. That's why I'm sitting here, because they're over there. <laughs> right? When was the last time we were thankful? I love my beautiful bride back there. I love her. I'm thankful for her. Thankful. Oh, I know sometimes we don't show it. I don't know about you, but it'd be tough to do without her, amen? She asked me that question the other day. And I saw the finances. No, no, I didn't know I did. Let me, we joke around a lot. I think that's what keeps us so fresh with one another. We joke around a lot. I'm very thankful for her. She's God's blessing to me. I'm thankful for our children. I'm thankful for our grandchildren. I'm thankful for you. More than anything, I'm thankful for the salvation I have in Jesus Christ. We sang those songs this morning. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Verse 16 says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Richly dwell within you. I thought about that. You see, within the unity of the body of Christ to, to understand for Jesus to richly dwell in me, I must be willing to be in his word. That's more than just on a Sunday morning or Sunday morning and a Wednesday night. To let it richly dwell within me. How else will I know what the blueprint for my life is if I don't open the book? I've got to be willing to be in the book. We have policy manuals in everything that we do. When I was with the patrol, we had this huge, it was, it was bigger than the Bible. We had this huge policy manual. It covered everything. Gene, I don't know if you remember, we had the very first policy manual. It told us how we were to sit down and eat, how we were supposed to take our hat off. Believe it or not, troopers know how to eat. And I'm talking more than donuts, amen? It told us, did it not, Gene? It told us how to eat, how to hold our fork, how to, when we walked into a courtroom, how to take our hats off, how to make our shoes look. It told us everything. The Word of God has the blueprint for your life. We're to be richly dwelling in His Word. With all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. And then he wraps up with this. Notice this. Unity within the body of Christ. How we exemplify who we are in our faith he says, whatever you do. Now, this is interesting. Don't miss this. He says, whatever you do, whether it is in how you speak, whether it's in your word or your deeds or your actions, okay, whatever you do, what's it say, church? Come on, what's it say? It's up on the screen. Do what? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him 
to God the Father. So, unity in the body of Christ. Unified in the power of prayer. Unified in the vision that God has for His church in reaching the lost. And unified in our faith. And to exemplify who Jesus Christ is in us. In everything that we say. And everything that we do. As Gary comes and he begins to play. That beautiful song, Just As I Am. You see, I mean, if you really think about it, those words are true. Just as I am. You see, you didn't have to come into this house today and wear certain clothes. We're all dressed differently. There was a time that I used to wear a coat and tie when I would stand behind this. I thought that, that, that you know, I have to look a certain way. You know, they, they kind of teach you you got to look a certain way. This is who I am. I've joked around about, you know, there's going to be some day I'm going to get all scraggly looking. Going to get a couple of days of growth and put me on some old dingy clothes when I'm like working in the yard. And I'm going to find me a church. I'm going to walk in. And I'm going to sit in the front and see if they ask me to leave. There are churches like that, quote unquote. You know that? Because you got to look a certain way. Jesus is just as you are, come to me. Jesus is letting me do the cleaning. Like that young man Wednesday, his life is forever changed. His life is forever changed. He's been cleaned up from the inside out, not from the outside in. As he plays and sings two verses of this song, that's it. Here's the invitation this morning. It's real simple. If you came in this house this morning without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can have him right where you're at. You don't need to come up here, do a special dance, or shake my hand. Right where you're at, you can call on the name of Jesus. Right where you're at. You can say, Jesus, I believe in what you did on the cross for me. Jesus, I want your salvation. Jesus, I believe that. I confess to you and I call upon your name to save me right now. Jesus, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for your blood that cleanses me. Jesus, my life will forever be changed. The Word of God says when you call upon the name of Jesus, the Word of God says thou shalt be saved. Call on the name of Jesus where you're at. You get the gift of eternal life. Your life is changed. It'll never be the same. You're welcomed into the family of God. Maybe this morning you're in this house. Man, I tell you, you've not been living a life for Christ. You haven't been humble. You've not been compassionate. Maybe you've not been allowing the Holy Spirit to use you in those places He wants to use you. Well, Pastor, I'm not going to come forward. People don't think, you know, I've done something wrong. Sometimes we need to just fall on our face because we need to do something right. 